أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وبه نستعين صلى الله عليك يا سيدي يا مولاي يا رسول الله وعلى أحل بيتك المذمومين صلى الله عليك يا سيدي يا مولاي مولاي وابن مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة يا غريب يا مذلوم يا أتشان كربلا ما خاب من تمسك بكم ولا من من لجأ إليكم صادتي يا ليتنا كنا معكم فنفوز فوزا عظيما قال الله العظيم في محكم كتابه الكريم وقوله الحق ولستق القائلين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم لقد كان في قصصهم إبرة لأول الألباب آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم سلوا على الله There is no doubt that amongst the best ways and mechanisms by which we communicate today is via a good anecdote. Everybody loves a good story. And with the rise in technology and the advancement in civilization, we recognize historically of the central importance of something like that of the oral tradition. Communities in the past that were even illiterate, they used to make sure that they were passing down knowledge by means of orally offering certain anecdotes, certain lessons, morals, and etiquette toward their children, grandchildren, and so on and so forth. And today, storytelling in and of itself has shifted into very different means. While maybe we are not necessarily telling as many stories to our children, we're watching them, we're reading them, we are seeing YouTube shorts, and reels on Instagram, all at the end of the day that are seeking toward providing us a unique and a meaningful lesson. For something like that of a story, if it has a good plot and it has really interesting characters and it has a fundamental meaning and essence to it at the end of the day, there's an opportunity for us again to extract some sense of meaning. We're able to deduce some vital, important, moral lesson. And that's why, for instance, when we come to gatherings like these ones, in which we gather in honor of the grandson of the messenger of God, and we relate ourselves toward this story, the story of Karbara, and the story of Sayyid al-Shuhada al-Husayn alayhi salam, we know and we realize just how incredibly moving that it is. And that's amongst the reasons why we repeat this story year after year, and why we have such a close attachment to it. At the end of the day, we see ourselves in the characters. We see ourselves in these historical figures and personalities. We see ourselves standing in front of Imam al-Husayn alayhi salam as if we were Hur ibn Yazid al-Riyahi in this ultimate path towards seeking redemption for everything that has gone wrong in our own hearts and in our own souls. We see the elderly personalities on the day of Ashura, like that of Habib ibn Madaha, like that of Muslim ibn Awsaja. And at the same time, we see the youngest of the youth. We see the six month old infant. We see Qasim ibn al Hassan. We see men and we see women. We see the youth and we see the elderly. We see those who are higher in the socioeconomic class and those who are lower. We see diversity in all of its manifestation. And again, we have to recognize that the way that we narrate this story and the way that we speak to the tragedy of Karbala in gatherings like these ones year after year are amongst the most important means and mechanisms that is allowed for the story of Imam al-Husayn to be immortalized. And you see the strong emphasis 
placed by the Prophet, by the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, as we'll take a look at in a little while, on how we narrate the story, on the language that we employ towards speaking toward the details of the story, on the strong sentiment and focus on showing emotion and grieving. I don't know of any ritual performed by any community, any society, any religion, where people look forward to coming to a gathering so they can cry. Do you know one? Maybe there is one, I don't know. I'm not saying that there's not. I have never seen one in my life where people, they look forth, they spend out of their wealth, out of their time, just so that they can grieve over someone who has passed away 14 centuries ago. But there's a draw to it. Because again, at the end of the day, the emotion, the story, the anecdote, the call that stems from the tragedy of Karbala and from this most immortal narrative that we have within human history, it calls us toward that of higher value. It brings us closer, closer toward sacrifice, toward justice, toward patience, toward submission, toward mercy, toward love. For all of these themes are consistently employed, manifested, illuminated on the 10th of Muharram, on the day of Ashura. And so for today's discussion, insha'Allah ta'ala, I want to speak to the role of storytelling and specifically the recitation of poetry in terms of how it preserves the Karbala narrative on three different dimensions. The first dimension to speak to how important it is for us to recognize the power of communication. The second dimension in terms of the role that the Imams of Ahlul Bayt salam, played in preserving storytelling of the tragedy of Karbala. And in the third dimension, some important manifestations of symbolism and our role in terms of how we should be engaging in the symbolism of storytelling of the Karbala narrative. So let's jump right into dimension number one of the conversation. And that is with regards toward the power of language or the power of communication. It goes without saying that our words, they hold an incredibly great amount of weight. And that famous narration from Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu was salam. He states about the tongue that its weight is insignificant, but its potential is deadly, for lack of a better translation. That this tongue of ours in our mouth is just a piece of flesh. But what potential that it has, one line, one statement, one remark, one comment that we pass, it could break somebody's heart. It could break a family. It could break a community. By one statement that we make with a little bit of frustration and a little bit of anger, how much regret that we can endure or that we can ensue just by virtue of one line. <clears throat> Undoubtedly, language and communication is super important, particularly for us as believers. But when you go toward the world of literature and the world of knowledge and the world of academia, where all they do is oftentimes focus on language, on words, on semantics. I read an article some little while ago that spoke toward the most important or influential words in the English language. Those which, if you utter them, they automatically change your perception of how you're seeing that day. In other words, the words that bring us joy and happiness. And amongst these words that were written in this article, it said, for instance, if someone says sunlight, someone says sunset, someone says summer, someone says Saturday mornings, someone says the smell of coffee, someone says a cupcake, you see and you hear all of these words and all of a sudden they generate a little bit of happiness. We become a bit more optimistic when you are sitting at the sunset, watching the sunset on a beach, for instance, on a Saturday in the summer while you're eating a cupcake. Sounds pretty awesome, right? Everything sounds great. What does not sound great about that? 
there are certain words. If you just say them, it brings you closer toward value. It brings you a little bit more optimistic. It makes you happier. It makes you more joyful. Love, mercy, generosity, altruism. We all relate to words like these ones. And we all love to speak about words like these ones. That's why, again, the way that we employ language and the way that any author employs language, the way that any marketeer, someone who's in marketing, I don't know if that's a word, if the way that they employ language is so vital and so important, which is why it's something that people study with such detail and with such precision. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he makes mention of this as well, twice within the whole of Quran. Many, many other times, maybe but two examples that we want to take a look at. Is he, the first one of them, is the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us to communicate. He states, Udu ila sabila rabbik bil hikmati wal mu'idatil hasana wa jadilhum billati hi ahsan. He states, and bring people to the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Udu ila sabila rabbik bil hikmah. Number one, by being wise. Meaning, have a sense of awareness of your surroundings knowing when to speak, knowing how to speak, all of these are various manifestations of wisdom. When someone wants to tell a story, when someone wants to prove their point, when someone wants to make an argument, when we say it angrily, when we say it in frustration, when we say it when our emotions are really high, the potential for us to get that message across toward the individual that we're talking to probably doesn't hold the same weight as it does if we're rational, if we are, have some nice anecdote to it, if we are appealing in the way that we're speaking, everyone understands what I'm saying. It's super important for us to recognize our surroundings when we're communicating something. Number two, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, Udu ila sabila rabbik bil hikmati wal mu'idatil hasana. In addition to that, make sure that we're utilizing beautiful language. Speak well, be eloquent. When you want someone to buy your product, or when you're trying to sell your service to someone else, we want to make sure that we're utilizing the most attractive language that's also simplistic enough for them to understand, but also making sure that we're choosing choice words that is allowing for the message to get through. One mo'idatin hasana. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states that when you're bringing people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you got to do the same as well. Be wise. Know who your crowd is. Know your surroundings. Know who you're speaking to. Know when is the right time to speak. Not every time is the right time to try to convince your wife or your husband or your parents or your children of whatever it is that you want. We know this. That's why it's so important, again, that we have an awareness of the surroundings. One mo'idat al-hasana. And make sure that you're choosing the best of language. وَجَادِلْهُمْ billati هِيَ أَحْسَنَ And at the end of the day, if things get heated and you're in are in a moment of debate or of argument with someone else, make sure that you take the higher road and you utilize better language than what they may use to you. That's what's going to allow for people to be convinced this is the mechanism, amongst the mechanisms that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala employs or teaches us to employ when we want to communicate to others. And the second one of them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in Surah Yusuf chapter 12, لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي قَسَسِهِمْ إِبْرَةٌ لِأُولِي الْأَنْفَاقِ That surely in this book, there are stories so that you might take lesson if you are amongst those who reflect. Meaning what? The Qur'an filled from beginning to end with anecdotes. Filled. There's an anecdote in Surah Al-Qalam, which is the first anecdote revealed within the whole Qur'an. There's a story of Yusuf. The story of Musa السلام, which is from the beginning of the Qur'an till the end of the Qur'an. The story of Isa, the story of Al-Qarnayn, the story of the brothers of Yusuf, the story of Ibrahim and Ismail. There are certain manifestations of the story of Maryam السلام, of Bilqis, the Queen of Sheba, of Sulaiman, Dawood. There are stories and anecdotes that are filled within the whole of Qur'an. Why? Because at the end of the day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to reflect upon them. Someone says, yeah, there are all of these stories within the whole of Quran, but none of them are complete. 
So how can we really deduce some meaning from these stories when they're all half little tidbits across the entirety of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Well, my friends, it's super important to understand that the whole Qur'an is not a book of history, nor is it a book of science, and certainly it's not a storybook, but it's a book of guidance. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions certain realities within the whole Qur'an, the objective and the purpose is that we take the lesson that is present in front of our eyes, and we seek toward finding a lesson, even though it might be particularly difficult. Someone once asked me, for instance, uh, when Musa alayhi salam, he threw down the stick, how tall was the stick? I have no idea, right? Someone might say, for instance, what color was the shirt of Yusuf alayhi salam that he gives to Yaqub to, run up, to rub on top of his eyes? Who cares? Who cares if it was white or if it was black or if it was brown or if it was yellow? What difference does it make at the end of the day if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not mention with precision or with detail what that detail was within that particular anecdote, nor is it mentioned within the ruwayat of Ahlul Bayt salam, the lesson in and of itself is that which we should be looking toward. And why? Why is it then that God, He reveals all of these anecdotes and stories within the whole Quran? Firstly, for three reasons. Reason number one is that a story is the best way to learn from a very young age. From a very young age, we read in our school systems, Aesop's Fables, the story of the tortoise and the hare, for instance, right? We hear all of these anecdotes and stories at the end of the day, an anecdote allows for us to understand or to extract or to deduce some sort of moral or ethical lesson. It's much easier for someone to watch a movie than to watch a book or than to read a book, am I right? Why? because you're watching the story unfold in front of your eyes, which is why unfortunately people don't read anymore because they see too much access toward their screens and their devices. At the end of the day, there is nothing more telling, more meaningful than a good story as long as it has a unique lesson to it. Take a look. The story, there's a famous saying that states that the Historically, there were two groups of class. Uh, amongst them were the philosophers, and the other ones were the, were the prophets. The philosophers were really intelligent. They used to rationalize all of the most complicated issues in the world. They used to you know, reflect upon the creation of the heavens and the earth in the most detailed and in the most precise of ways. But folks who were religious, they used to just sit with their community and tell them stories. Today, no one really cares about what a philosopher has to say, but people love religion. There's people who criticize religion, they often say this. What I'm trying to say is at the end of the day, what's so unique about a good anecdote is that it speaks to the hearts of people. And in the hadith of the Messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, he states, He states, Speak to people, in accordance with the level of their intellect. So the first reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala employs anecdotes and stories within the whole of Quran is because there's no better way to learn than via a good story. The second one of these reasons why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala employs stories within the whole of Quran perhaps is to console the Messenger of God sallallahu alayhi wa the Prophet of God had to go through such immense difficulty and hardship, particularly in those early years when he was preaching in Mecca before the migration to Medina. And so he would be in front of his community and they would throw the intestines of animals at him. They would throw the feces of animals at him while he was trying to preach to them. When he was in private, they would abuse him physically, verbally, to the extent that his closest of family members, including his daughter Fatima the Zahra, who was in her childhood, would come and wipe off the blood from the face and from the back of the Messenger of God Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It was really, really difficult for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, out of his love for his Messenger, he reveals to him the story of Musa, and of Nuh, and of Ibrahim, and of Isa, in order to remind him 
alayhi salatu wasalam, that look, that which you are going through today, your predecessors from amongst the prophets also had to go through. In a way, it was sought to validate the Messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. A first reason again why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presents stories within the whole Quran, well, stories are a good way for us to relate to. Secondly, to console the Messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. And thirdly, towards speaking toward important matters of history. Naturally, these stories, we believe them to be true. And we believe them toward exposing us toward that which is embedded, which is founded, which is grounded within our religious tradition. And if you take a look, maybe we have 25 or 27 names of the prophets within the whole of Quran. But like we know that there are many, many more, 124,000. At the end of the day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to preserve these names for a good reason and for us again to take lesson to the best of our ability and capacity from them. I'll open up one quick parenthesis. A couple of years ago, I was with my family and my older daughter who was then five years old. She said, Baba, you know, I heard in the lecture you said that we have only 25 prophets' names in the Qur'an. I said, yeah. She said, but in Sunday school, I learned that there's 124,000 prophets. I said, that's right, good job. And she said, what are the names of all of the other prophets? So I said, Baba, I don't know. I have no idea. My daughter, five years old at the time, she says, what type of sheikh are you? <laughs> so now I still question myself with the same question, what type of sheikh am I? How do I not know all these names of the prophets? Anyway, over here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he seeks toward preserving these specific names and these specific anecdotes for a particular reason again, such that we are able to be amongst those who reflect upon them specifically. And before I move on to the next dimension of the discussion, let me just say this particular last point on this item. And that is that today, many scholars of the English language and linguists and those who write both fiction and non-fiction speak toward the two primary pillars of storytelling. Now follow along with me because it's all going to translate into our conclusion in a couple of moments. The two pillars of storytelling are number one, that the story has to be immersive. And secondly, that the story has to be emotional. Now follow along with me for a second. When they say that the story has to be immersive, it means that the story that is being told has to have a pull, has to have a draw, has to have characters that are relatable, have to have a certain, for instance, plot that might seem interesting for me to open the book or to turn on the movie or to click that button on Netflix. There has to be something about it that is appealing to me as an individual. And the second pillar is that which is emotional. Meaning there has to be something that is allowing for my heart rate to increase while I'm reading or while I'm watching that wants me to understand and recognize what is going to happen at the end of that book or at the end of that show, at the end of that movie. Is that right? Think about it. In any book that you read, in any movie that you watch, if you're sitting on your couch, you press X button to turn on your Netflix to watch this movie, in the first five minutes, if there's not something immersive, what's gonna happen? You're gonna turn it off. And if you get through, I don't know, the first 15 or 20 minutes and you're still not moved, you're going to turn it off. But through that first 20, 30 minutes, if you really want to know what's going to happen at the end of it, you're going to stick around to watch the entire film, even if the ending disappoints you, right? It has to be both immersive and emotional. And that's why when we come again to these anecdotes that are mentioned within the whole of Quran, the story of Karbara, we know undoubtedly that there is something so immersive about it. There is something that immediately draws us to the anecdote and at the same time its emotion draws us toward knowing and hearing the details even though we know it with such precision. We still want to hear it again and again and again. And that brings me then to the second dimension of the discussion. And that is with regards to how the Imams of Ahlul Bayt they preserved the storytelling of the Karbala narrative. 
صلوا على محمد وعلى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد First a bit of historical context My friend it's super important for us to remember the incredible difficulty and hardship that the Imam Zahir al-Bayt alayhi salam had to endure immediately after the day of Ashura and the preservation of this historical narrative did not come down to us with ease if you read the ahadith of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam and if you study the historical transmission of the ahadith of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam you will see that there are narrators of our hadith reports that lived in secrecy that the imams alayhi salam condemned them publicly in order to preserve them from the watchful eye of the government authorities the best example is the example of zurara ibn ayun anyone know zurara ibn ayun zurara ibn ayun is the most important perhaps narrator of hadith within our religious tradition he narrates from imam al-baqir narrates from imam sadiq if you open up a book like that of kitab al-kafi and you just flip through the pages and you just look for random names you are bound to find zurara multiple times on every page because of the amount of reports that he narrates from al-Baqir and al-Sadiq and you'll find that Imam al-Baqir and Imam al-Sadiq would openly condemn and do la'an of Zurara ibn Ayyun publicly, why? because they wanted to publicly disassociate from Zurara because of a fear that the Abbasid, the Umayyad authorities would capture Zurara ibn Ayyun and put him in jail because of his relationship with Ahlul Bayt you follow what I'm saying? so we're talking about a time period which was incredibly hard and which was incredibly difficult. And knowing very well how central the narrative of Karbala was and became post the day of Ashura, every effort was also made toward eradicating the memory of Imam al-Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam. The Umayyads banned the ziyara of Imam al-Hussein. The Abbasids banned the ziyara of Imam al-Hussein. Mutawakkil al-Abbasi famously destroys the grave of Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam between three and thirteen times in conflicting historical reports. At the very least, it was destroyed at a minimum of three times, where he even sought towards shifting the river Euphrates through Karbala, through the grave of Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam, to eradicate its memory in its entirety. And amongst the ways that the Imams of Ahlul Bayt sought to preserve this tradition was by cultivating a community of poets who would narrate the tragedy of Karbala, oftentimes in secret. Now hear me out. There are various important sort of mechanisms and tools employed by Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam to allow for this anecdote to reach us today. The first one of them was a strong encouragement from the Imams of Ahlul Bayt to recite poetry against all odds. Let me give you an example. We have a hadith narrated in Kamil al-Ziyarat that states, for instance, Imam al-Sadiq telling one of his companions that the one who recites one line of poetry in honor of my grandfather Hussein, and he causes 50 people to weep, everyone in that gathering receives paradise and then he states no the one who recites one line of poetry and it causes 40 people to weep that gathering is offered paradise he says no 30 people no 20 people no 10 people no the one who recites one line of poetry and one person in that gathering weeps then everyone is granted paradise and then the narrator states, then the Imam alayhi salam paused and he said, no. The one who recites one line of poetry and he himself tries to weep, the entire congregation receives paradise. Why? Number one, toward cultivating this emotional environment around the tragedy of Karbala. Number two, also to allow for the most salient features of the tragedy of Karbala to make sure it's being passed down generationally. And amongst those draws, again, is that emotional connection to Imam Hussein, alayhi salatu wasalam. Wow. 
Another hadith from the Imam alayhi salam, it states that the one who recites one line of poetry in honor of us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant them a home in paradise. Consistent reports that speak to these incredibly lofty rewards for the recitation of poetry for Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, or in other words, to transmit these teachings, which are incredibly sacred. I'll give you one more. I said that one day, Harun al Rashid, he calls Imam Musa ibn Ja'far al Kadim alayhi salam to his court in Baghdad. <laughs> Now Harun al-Rashid was incredibly intelligent and he was very politically shrewd, unlike some of our politicians today. He calls um, Imam Musa ibn Ja'far alayhi salam and he says, I want you to sit with me throughout the course of an entire day. And his objective was to increase his political legitimacy amongst those who had animosity toward him because of his oppression to Ahlul Bayt. So in other words, he wanted to put on like some sort of photo op by telling the Imam salam, to come and sit like on a throne next to him in order to demonstrate to the public, look, me and the family of the Prophet, we get along really, really well. And he called upon everyone within Baghdad to come and grant or offer or shower gifts upon Musa ibn Ja'far salam. The Imam salam, he refused. He says, I do not want to participate in any of this. And the Harun al-Rashid and the Abbas said, Khulafa, as they often would, they said, if you don't participate, we're going to kill you. So the Imam salam, reluctantly agrees. He comes to the court of Harun al-Rashid, he sits next to him. And one by one, there are people who try to win the favor of the political authority. So they come and they try to bring you know, various gifts, and they present them to Imam Musa al-Kadim salam. And he couldn't refuse them. So he's taking them one by one by one. When all of a sudden, there was an elderly man who walks into the gathering. And he states, Oh Imam Musa ibn Ja'far, I came out of my love for you. He says, Thank you so much, Allah bless you. He says, But I don't have any money, nor do I have a lot of belongings, such that I can offer you a gift. He says, It's okay, you don't have to offer me a gift. He says, No, no, no. I wrote a poem in honor of your grandfather, Sayyid Shabab Ahl al Jannah. I wrote a poem for Imam Hussein alayhi salam and I wanted to recite it for you as my token of love for you. He says, go ahead. At this moment, this man, he recited some lines of poetry that caused Imam Musa al-Kadim alayhi salam to start to grieve. As he was about to leave, the Imam alayhi salam called this elderly man. He says, from morning till night, I've been sitting next to Harun, and all of these people have preserved and presented to me all of these gifts. He said, because of this one line of poetry that you recited for Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, all of it is for you. Mm -hmm. The encouragement, again, around grieving, around recitation, around storytelling of the tragedy of Karbala reached this level for the Imam of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam because it was so central and so core to our theology. A second pillar of how the Imams of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam they utilize poetry as a means and as a mechanism toward preserving the tragedy of Karbala is to encourage specific individuals to continue along with their recitation because their recitations called toward those higher values. Again, pay attention to me for a moment. Amongst the foundations of these lines of poetry or of these gatherings of majalis for Imam al Hussein, alayhi salatu wasalam, they were threefold. Number one, they drew people toward grief. They were emotional. Number two, they preserved our theology. They preserved what it means toward knowing who God is, who the Prophet is, who the Imams of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam were. The idea was to not allow for anyone to make this assumption that this was just a regular man who fought in a tragic battle and was killed, but it was to consistently remind us of the station of Imam al Hussein, of the station of Ahlul Bayt, salam, which is why when we go for ziyarah today, the prerequisite to receiving all of those rewards that we hear on the member all the time, it states, Manzar al Hussein, Arif al Bihaqqa, the one who visits Imam al Hussein, knowing his station. Then they get the reward of 100 Hajj and 100 Umrah and so on and so forth. 
The one who grieves for Imam al Hussein, knowing his station, then they get paradise and then they get X and Y and Z. Only once we fulfilled the prerequisite amongst the sort of stresses by the Imams of Ahlul Bayt employed was to making sure that they were sort of giving a platform toward those poets who were doing their best job toward illuminating the theology of Ahlul Bayt And thirdly, that these poems, that these majalis, that these gatherings, they sought toward cultivating and creating an environment that caused everyone else to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At the end of the day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He loves these tears that we shed for Imam al Hussein. He loves this grief that we have for Imam al Hussein. He loves the black that we wear for Imam al Hussein. He loves the money that we give for Imam. All of that thing is great. But at the end of the day, what's good is good. We can also do better. And that is by translating these tears into action. By translating this grief for the son of the daughter of the messenger of God, peace and blessings be upon them, toward a higher calling. And that is to the values as demonstrated by Imam al Hussein, that of justice, and that of sacrifice, and that of patience, and that of generosity, and that of love, and so on and so forth. And so you find individuals like that of Qumayt ibn Zayd al Asadi. You find individuals like that of Di'bal al Khuza'i. You find individuals like these giants, Sayyid al Himyari, who the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, when they would recite certain lines of poetry, again, they would be praised and they would be honored and they would be certain du'as recited by the Imams of Ahlul Bayt for them specifically, again, because they elevated the community with their emotion, with their understanding of who the Imams of Ahlul Bayt were, and thirdly, because they drew people closer toward Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala via these recitations. And that brings me then to the third dimension of our discussion. How our majalis are meant toward employing this symbolism such that we can call toward those higher values. Before that, let me just offer a bit of an introduction. Before that, maybe one salawat ala Everyone good? Following? First day? We're getting tired? Yeah, I've got to deal with it. I'm sorry. It's so important, like we mentioned before, how we utilize words and how we communicate to one another. And that's why symbolism is so vital and so important in terms of how we employ language. Let me give you a couple of examples, at least in the English language, of how we employ symbolism. If I say something like, she is uh, a lion on the basketball court, what does that demonstrate towards someone who's listening? I Meaning that she's brave, she's courageous, she's fearless. The word lion in sports, for instance, is symbolic of something that speaks towards something different than the fact that we're calling this girl a lion, an animal. No, we mean the lion is someone who's fearless, someone who's courageous, someone who's brave. Make sense? If I say someone, for instance, this guy is like an ocean, what does that mean? An ocean in knowledge, someone who's very deep, they're well read, they think a lot, so on and so forth. If I say something like, this guy throws a football like uh, Josh Allen, what does that mean? That means he has like a really strong arm, a Buffalo Bills fan. This guy shoots a three-pointer like Steph Curry, means he's like really, really good at basketball, he has a good jump shot. We utilize certain language within our communities, within society, which is always shifting, which is always adapting. And symbolism is so important in order to elevate the point that we're trying to elucidate to someone else. Make sense? Everyone following? Symbolism is incredibly important. And similarly, when we come to gatherings like these ones, our majadis are filled with symbols. They're filled with symbols that are meant, again, toward drawing us closer toward the ultimate objective. And similarly, when we speak and when we narrate the tragedy of Karbala, when we recite the poetry for Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, when we are utilizing the majalis and the member in the way that we do all across the world, it's so important for us to remember that these gatherings, they are the face of the Shia tradition all across the world. And that means the symbols that we employ, the language that we are utilizing, 
the mechanisms by which we communicate. All of these things, they're public today. This lecture is being live streamed. It's being recorded. There are people watching it who are believers and non-believers alike. At the end of the day, we have to make sure that we're fulfilling a responsibility toward the Majlis in the same way that those poets of Ahlul Bayt then utilized their platforms as a voice for the religious tradition of their Imams. And that's why, again, symbolism, communication, language is so vital and so important. What did we say before? We said before that there are two pillars of storytelling. The first one of them is that the story has to be immersive. It has to be a means by which it draws people in. The second one is that it's emotional. Emotional, we got that one down pat. But if someone sees a gathering by physical eye, by the words that are being recited, that are distant, how are they ever going to be drawn in in the first place to the anecdote? means that we need to make sure that we're packaging it in such a way that's digestible, that others are also able to receive it in a way, again, where they can find themselves in an immersive nature in their appreciation and recognition of what this message is all about. And I'll demonstrate to you via a couple of examples of how some of the poets of Ahlul Bayt السلام, used to do this. Salu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Now take a look again. Take a look to see how or the poetry endorsed by the Imams of Ahlul Bayt السلام, and also what work that we should be doing in order toward reaching a level whereby we are trying to uphold these values as well. There is a famous poem, for instance, that states, "Ayuqtalu dhamaan Hussein bi Karbala, wa fi kull adm min anamilihi bahru, wa waliduhu saqi ala alhoud fi ghadin, wa Fatima tu ma furati laha mahru." The poet he states, "Is Hussein to be killed thirsty on the plains of Karbala, when each and every one of his fingers is a river?" Is Hussein to be killed thirsty on the plains of Karbala when his father is the caretaker of the pool of Kautha? When we go to paradise, where are we going to drink except by the hands of Imam Amir al Mu'mini? Is Hussein to be killed on the plains of Karbala when his mother Fatima's mahar is the river Euphrates? What does it demonstrate? The symbolism, the depth. How can Hussein, alayhi salam, he be someone who is killed thirsty when he himself is an ocean, an ocean of knowledge, like we said before. We all utilize this language. How could Hussein alayhi salam be killed thirsty when his father is the caretaker of water in paradise? How could Hussein be killed thirsty on the plains of Karbala when his mother Fatima al Zahra is at the rank that she's at that she's at? There's a theological lesson here. There's an emotional connection. And it's something that calls us toward being in a state of love, fidelity, submissiveness toward the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, all in the same breath. Emotional, theological, and ethical. I'll give you another example. The example of Da'bal al Khazai that he recites to Imam Ali ibn Musa Rada alayhi salam. Many of us have heard this famous poem. Allah <laughs> He enters in the gathering of Imam Ali al Rada and the Imam Ali salam he states, O oh, Debbal, recite for me some lines of poetry, for surely these are the days of grief that befell upon us, the Ahlul Bayt. These are in these first days of Muharram. Debbal, he recites, Afatimu lo khilta al Husayn mujaddala, wa qad mata at shanan bishatti furati, idan lana tamta al khadda fatima indahu. وأجريت الدم العين في الوجنات أفاتم قومي يا ابنة الخير واندبي نجوم السماوات بأرض فلاتي He states, O oh Fatima, if you could see your son Hussein laying lifeless on the plains of Karbala, having died by the banks of the river Euphrates, you would have begun to slap your cheeks at the sight of him. O oh Fatima, while your tears were running down your cheeks. O oh, Fatima, you are the daughter of all that is great. She's the daughter of the Messenger of God. 
So stand and rise and mourn today, for the stars of the heavens have fallen on this desolate land. Again, the emotion or connection that we build and that we connect toward this line. In addition to the theology that it employs, again, it demonstrates the unique rank of the Ahlul Bayt And thirdly, again, the ethical call that it's making for us to also utilize these tears as a means and a mechanism towards something higher. Thirdly, the poem of Sayyid al himyari who Imam al-Sadiq calls Sayyid al-Shu'ara, the leader of all the poets. Imam al-Sadiq he tells Sayyid al himyari to recite some lines in honor of Imam al-Husayn salam He states, Umrur ala jadat al-Husayn wa qul a'adhumah al-Zakiyya يا أعظم لا زلت من وطفاء الساكبة الروية ما نبعيش بعد ربك بالجياد الأوجية. He states, pass by the grave of Hussein عليه السلام and say to those pure bones, O bones, may you ever remain refreshed by the flowing of these tears upon you. Life has lost all sweetness. There is no life without you. O oh, Aba Abdullah, the moment that your body was trampled by those horses. Sayyid al Himyari, he narrates, Ra'aytu Jumu'u Ja'far ibn Muhammad, that the Haddar ala Khaddei, war tafa astorahi wal buka min dari, hatta amarahu bil imsak fasik. Sayyid al Himyari, he states that after I recited these lines, I looked at Imam al Sadiq alayhi salam, and his head was down, and his eyes were overflowing with tears until there was screaming and crying really loudly from his home. And a call was made for me to stop, stop, meaning don't continue, don't recite anymore. It's too difficult for me to hear. The emotion, the theology, the call that it's making again, that's what it's all about, my friends. That's what these gatherings are about. That's what these majadis are about. And that's what we need to be cultivating. This majlis of Imam al Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam is sacred, and we have a responsibility toward them, peace and blessings be upon them, to making sure that it fulfills all of these primary pillars. I'll leave us with this tradition from Imam al Baqir alayhi salam. He states, fi hikmat al Dawood, he states in the scrolls of Dawood alayhi salam, there's a tradition that states, yanbaghi lil Muslim an yakuna malikan li nafsa. مُقْبِلًا عَلَى شَعْنَهِ عَارِفًا بِأَحْدِ زَمَانِهِ فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهُ وَلَا تُذِيءُ حَدِيثُنَا Hear me out, or hear your imam out. He states that the Muslim should be someone who has control over their own self, who is attentive to their own affairs, who is knowledgeable about their surroundings, and who makes sure that they do not disclose the ahadith of Ahlul Bayt السلام, without wisdom. Meaning what? That the way that we preserve, the way that we pass down, the way that we narrate these narrations, the way that we present ourselves to others, specifically in these days of Muharram and Ashura, are so important. At the end of the day, it's about calling toward the bigger picture for ourselves, but also for the world. That's what it's all about at the end of the day. And why not? Why not draw people toward this tragedy, this tragedy that undoubtedly through these words has the potential and the capacity to transform a heart, a dead heart. And that's why we come to gatherings like these ones. This tragedy of Imam al-Husayn alayhi salam and his remembrance, salamullah alayhi, like we know, it rejuvenates and awakens every single one of us in the same way that it caused an awakening in the ummah of the Messenger of God sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And why not show the emotion that we do? Why not grieve the way that we do? Did you know, my friends, that this tradition of grieving for the grandson of the Messenger of God began before the birth of Imam al-Husayn alayhi salatu wa sallam. Before the birth of the Imam. It is stated that one day, while Lady Fatima alayhi salam, she was pregnant with Imam al Hussein, sallallahu alayhi, that Lady Fatima was in the room, and the Messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, 
was in another room where he was accompanied by the angel Jibra'il. Jibra'il descends upon him. And a few moments later, the Imam, sallallahu alayhi, is, or the Messenger of God, is overwhelmed with grief. Imam Amir al Mu'mineen, alayhi salam, he enters into his gathering. And he states, O oh, Messenger of God, he says, Why do I see you in this state of grief? He says, O oh, Amir al Mu'mineen, keep this between us because my daughter Fatima is pregnant with her son. And I don't want her to hear what I'm about to tell you. He says, oh, Amir al-Mu'mineen, of course. Imam al-Hussein, Imam, Imam, Imam Ali, salam, he turns his ear toward the Messenger of God, and Rasulullah begins to whisper in his ear that Jibra'il has descended upon me and has informed me about what will happen to your son, Aba Abdullah. He says, and what will happen, O Messenger of God? He says that he will be surrounded only in a few years by those who proclaim their love for me. 30,000 people ready to shed his blood with swords and with spears and with rocks, all in the name of La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. In another report, it's narrated in Kamil al Ziyarat that the Messenger of God sallallahu alayhi wa ala, had gone to the house of Ali and Fatima one day in order to see his family. And it became the time of prayers. The Messenger of God went into one room and he began to perform his prayers. And he began to elongate this prostration. And Imam Amir al Mu'mineen, Lady Fatima, they heard some weeping, some grieving coming from the Messenger of God. Ali looks toward Fatima, Fatima looks toward Ali. He said, Is everything okay with our father? Amir al Mu'mineen, alayhi salam, he approaches the Messenger of God. He says, Oh Rasulullah, he says, You've been long in sujood. And we hear you weeping and we hear you grieving. He says, what's wrong? The messenger of God, he lifts his head. He says, bring them all to me. He's surrounded by Ali and Fatima and Hassan and Hussein. He states that when I was in prayers, Jibra'il, after I entered into sujood, had approached me. And he asked me, oh messenger of God, he says, do you love your family? He says, yes, of course I love my family. He says, then are you ready to hear what's going to happen to your family after you? He says, if that's the will of Allah. And he said, one by one, Jibra'il began to narrate to me about what is going to happen to each and every one of you until he told me about what is going to happen to my son, Abu Abdullah al Hussein, on the plains of Karbala. And I'll leave you with one more for today. It is stated that the Messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, of course, he was foretold of the location where his son would be killed on the plains of Karbala, in that sacred land of the king of martyrs, of the leader of the free, Abu al-Ahrar. It is stated that on the return back from the battle of Siffin, Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen, alayhi salam, along with his companions, his confidants, they had passed by a location. And at this moment, Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen, he asked, one of the guides in the middle of the desert, he said, what's the name of this location? He said that this location is known as Nainaba. At this moment, Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen, he ordered everyone to stop. He alighted from his horse. He picked up the sand from the ground. He smelt it. And then he looks toward his son and he called out, Sabran ya Aba Abdullah. Be patient, O Aba Abdullah. Imam al Hussein, he looks toward his father, all of the companions of Imam Ali who are returning back from Safin to re returning back to Kufa, they say, what are you speaking to, O Amir al-Mu'mineen, what do you mean? He says, my beloved, my brother, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, foretold to me that this was the location where my son Hussein is going to be killed. And then he began to look across his army and he began to tell them, each and every one of them, if you are present on that day, when you hear my son make that call, Hal min Nasir, make sure you are at the support of his. Only to know that Sayyid Shabab Ahlul Jannah, the leader of the youth of paradise, that young boy who was in the house of Rasulullah running around, that young boy who was climbing on the back of the Messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa ala, that young boy who the Messenger of God would state, Ahabb Allah man ahabba Husayna, that Allah loves the one who loves Hussein on the 10th of Muharram was left alone with only the swords and the spears of the army around him while his body lay lifeless on the plains of Karbala. 
We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with grief in our hearts, with tears in our eyes to allow for us to be amongst those to allow for us to be amongst those who live a life that resembles the life of Muhammad and Wa'ali Muhammad and to grant us a death that resembles the death of Muhammad and Wa'ali Muhammad We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we are able to uphold the virtues and the morals and the etiquette of Muhammad and Wa'ali Muhammad and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to never separate us from them in this world, nor in the barzakh, nor in the next life. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for tawfiq. Walhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu ala muhammad wa ala al-tahirin. Wa rahimallah man qara'a surat al-mubarakat al-fatiha. But before that one, salawat al